The fifth episode of Andor, titled The Axe Forgets, is out. The bulk of the episode is about Cassian continuing to find his way into this new group of rebels as they prepare to rob the nearby Imperial garrison. And we get the meaning of the title early on from Skeen when he says, The Axe Forgets, but the tree remembers. The Empire has hurt so many individuals, there's no way it could keep track of all of them. But those individuals will never forget. Or, to quote the incomparable M. Bison, For you, the day Bison graced your village was the most important day of your life, but for me, it was Tuesday. Even though Andor is broken into three episode arcs, and I very much felt that in today's episode, I feel like The Axe Forgets had one of the stronger themes running throughout its story, very much centered around its title. Cassian pointed out in episode 3 that to steal from the Empire, all you need to do is act like you belong, but he is unable to do that with his new crew. He can't just fake his way into their trust, and Skeen is the biggest illustration of that from the start, pressing Cassian on what brought him to their mission and what drives him to fight the Empire. They bond a little bit over their respective time in prison, but Skeen still finds Cassian's answers, how should we put it, vague and unconvincing. Especially when you compare him to someone like Nimic, who I continue to love. He is the true believer of what rebellion against the Empire actually means to the point where his friends tease him about it. I love that he points out the pace of oppression being so fast that a person can't mentally keep up with it all. It's easier to hide behind 40 atrocities than one single incident. That's true in the real world. Every day it feels like there's something else terrible going on somewhere, and it's impossible possible to care about everything all the time. It would certainly be easier to become numb to it all, and that's how you wind up with people like Perrin, but we'll come back to him. I want to focus on one storyline at a time. Cassian is again questioned about his beliefs, and he again brushes it off, but good, innocent, trusting Nimic at least accepts him as open to hearing more. I am still fearing for the little space nerd. He has the most character details of all the rebels in my mind. He builds models, he knows a lot about space, and he's writing a manifesto. He seems like the prime candidate to get hurt or killed on the mission, but it could prompt Cassian deeper into the philosophies behind Resistance. He could even even read what the kid has to say. But then we learn that the mission is in somewhat dire straits, because Vel and Terramin have no idea how to actually calibrate and fly their escape craft. Cassian makes a big show of telling them how it all works, and in doing so takes control of the piloting instead of acting as the backup. I suspect he has no idea how to calibrate the load of the ship, and he's just pretending to know so he can have at least a little more say in his own fate. Just like Vel and the others, he'll figure it out when the time comes. I might be wrong, Cassian did say he's flown one of those freighters before, but he also hasn't been honest with any of his compatriots so far. Either way, I like that the general plan is in the same spirit as the Battle of Scarif. We'll take the next chance and the next until we win the day, or the chances are spent. Rebellions are built on hope. Cassian is at least able to build some trust with his apparent expertise on the freighter as well as their planned formation when they go undercover as Imperial officers. As they train, we hear the roar of a TIE fighter and they have to scramble to cover up their blasters. I have seen and heard TIE fighters a million times in my life, but I love how they are treated as terrifying in this series. As far as that pilot knows, Cassian and his group are simple farmers, but they just can't help buzzing the ground and scaring everyone. We follow the fighter back to the Imperial garrison where we do a little catching up with Gorn. It's really great seeing him throughout the episode feigning loyalty to his fellow soldiers while his true loyalty to Aldani bubbles up. We later learn that he fell in love with a local of the planet, and I figure that led him to falling in love with the planet as well. He chastises underlings for using a holy site as target practice, demanding they clean it up for the sake of the Imperial Engineer's visit. He solemnly discusses the further desecration of the site, which is planned to be converted into an airfield. He thinks back on the days when thousands of Aldani were allowed to watch the Eye, which at this point is still seen as a beautiful event by the Imperials. The garrison Harrison all hopes they get the chance to see it personally, despite the fact that they displaced most of the people for whom it actually means something. Gorn's scenes were great at setting up the geography for the coming heist, and for raising the stakes for the character. I like him. 
As Cassian's crew begins the trek to the garrison, Vel gives him Gorn's story that led him to defect, saying everyone has their own rebellion. Every tree that has felt the axe of the Empire has its own story. Basically, I think she's saying, don't gatekeep the fight for good. Gorn is fighting for the people of Aldani. Nimic is fighting for philosophical reasons. Skeen is fighting for revenge. Some reasons are more noble than others, sure, but they've all found each other on the same side. I think that line is what finally pushes Cassian to be truthful with his new allies, and the truth hurts a bit, Nimic seems disappointed of course, but he gets over it. His honesty works, even causing Skeen to open up about his own story of when he felt the axe. To quote the Clone Wars a bit, the first step toward loyalty is trust. You must trust in others or success is impossible. A secret shared is a trust formed. Trust in your friends and they'll have reason to trust in you. No gift is more precious than trust. Trust is the greatest of gifts, but it must be earned. Courage makes heroes, but trust builds friendship. Star Wars has a lot to say about trust. Back on Coruscant, we see that Luthen is struggling with his own trust issues and fears. He's just waiting to hear some news about the mission, even though he knows there will be none. He just has to trust his team will get the job done, and there's nothing he can do to affect the outcome. That's how the episode ends, but I haven't even talked about Mon Mothma, Cyril and his mother, or the Imperial characters yet, so let's back it all up. First, it would appear that we have skipped over the dinner party with Sly Moore. I am disappointed. I was hoping to see Palpatine's chief of staff being the quote, fun one at a party, but it's all good. Perrin continues to be insufferable, calling their driver the driver, keeping a line between his status and those that work for him. Mon Mothma, who we know doesn't even trust the man, is still willing to learn his name and use it. And then we meet their daughter, Leda, and we continue to knock Mothma off the pedestal we've held her up on for decades. Not morally or anything, we've just never seen her be this vulnerable. It's frustrating seeing her being ganged up on by her family, but I also think it's good to give her, like, a leadership arc. Right now, she isn't even in control of her husband and daughter, but she's going to be in control of the entire Rebel Alliance. This woman is going to save the galaxy. Galaxy. We also see that she might have a selfish and vain side. We're hearing about it from Lita, but the words sting enough that I think she has a point. And I mean, how could Mothma not be a little disconnected, living the good life in the highest levels of Coruscant? She cares, and she wants to make a difference both in the Senate and with Luthen, but I don't know that she's ready to lose everything yet by disavowing the Emperor and going on the run. I do wonder if there is some hope for Perrin. He has the teeniest, tiniest arc in this episode. After Mon jabs at him for not caring about charity, he asks her to remind him of their driver's name so he can use it to ask him a question. He still totally sucks, but that's something. It's a start. Sticking with Coruscant, let's get into Cyril Karn's story. He opens the episode, and I love the scene of him in his bedroom. He's not in the upper levels of Coruscant, he is down low. He stares out the window as the sun briefly cuts between the skyscrapers, giving him the one glimpse of light he'll see all day. And then he has to endure a very mediocre breakfast when compared to what we saw laid out from on Mothma. To make matters worse, he has to eat with his constantly critical mother. We don't know her motivations yet, but I think she wants to climb the social ladder of Coruscant and has pinned all her hopes on her son. Cyril makes it clear she could have visited him on Morlana, but she makes dumb excuses. I think she just likes to think of herself as someone who lives in the core, and the rest of the galaxy is beneath her. She's firmly clutching to the middle of the ladder and smugly looking down at everyone beneath her, including Cyril. This is definitely the most I have felt for him in the series so far as we start to unravel why he is the way he is and how he became loyal to whatever will help him get his next promotion first and foremost. And it seems he also has some unresolved feelings surrounding Cassian, who he probably holds responsible for his recent failures. Cassian doesn't even know who Cyril is yet, but Cassian cut Cyril down, and the tree never forgets. Finally, we have to catch up with the Empire, who continues to take control over the Morlana sector and therefore Ferrix. We see citizens being displaced and workers having to clean up the destruction left by corporate security. The people of Ferrix are suffering, and all the Imperial captain in charge cares about is his new title, so he can feel just a little bit more important. 
In contrast, we see Dedra Miro going against her orders to continue looking into Imperial robberies. She seems like the mirror version of Nemec in some ways, a true believer of the ISB. Major Partagaz gave that speech about seeking out and curing symptoms, but when he was presented with symptoms, he brushed them off and told Miro to drop it. This storyline is so similar to Cyril's investigation into the murders after his own superior told him to stop. I'm sure Dedra is still looking to benefit herself, climb up the ranks and all that. She is an Imperial. She's the bad guy. But the writing is so good and the other Imperials are so hypocritical, she has become a protagonist of sorts because she's the underdog. She even earns the loyalty of her aide, and I expect she will soon find a kindred spirit in Karn. And now we've talked about everyone and everything. I think this was a very strongly written episode with a consistent theme running throughout. I can pinpoint how Cassian and several other characters changed over the course of the story. It didn't feel like it ended arbitrarily or suddenly like episode 4 did to me. Cassian, who has been lying to everyone since the series premiere, told the truth and gained some trust as they prepared for the exciting conclusion of this arc. Or... At least, I'm hoping and assuming it will be exciting. I still don't find this series to be boring at all. I love the character drama. I love the quiet scenes set at breakfast tables. But I find this to be a risky format. Build up tension and anticipation for two weeks, and then let it all explode. It worked great for the first three episodes, but we got to experience all of that in one day. Letting everything slowly build for 21 days is a different experience. I have faith that it will all pay off just as well as the first arc, but I had an improv teacher once tell me that the longer it takes you to think of something to say on stage, the bigger the audience's expectations will be. Basically, if it takes you 30 seconds to think of a joke, it better be a damn funny joke. I feel like I'm vibrating, waiting for this heist to go off. These last two episodes have set the stage and the stakes very well. What we've seen from the trailers looks pretty awesome, so I think and hope the payoff will be worth every second. Episode 6 might be nothing but action, but there is part of me that misses having even a minor action beat every week. No matter what, I still think Andor is well written and well executed on all accounts, because what I am saying is that it always leaves me wanting more, and that's exactly what a series should do. I cannot wait for episode 6 to see how this all concludes, but that's it for now. Let me know what you thought of The Axe Forgets in the comments, and come back at 6pm Eastern to join our live after show, No Ifs and or Buts, to talk about everything I didn't cover here with Molly and our friends at Resistance Broadcast. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel for all our and or coverage, follow us on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram, and consider checking out our our Patreon page for our video reactions and audio commentaries for every episode. And you can check out this playlist for all of our existing and or content. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.